I heard about a farmer that walked into attorney's office. He was wanting a divorce, and he said to this lawyer, he said, hey, I want to get me one of them divorces. And the attorney said, well, do you have any grounds? Farmer said, yeah, I got about 140 acres. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. Do you have a case? He said, no, I thought about it, but I wound up getting me a John Deere <laughs> instead of a case. Farmer says, um, no, no, you still don't understand. Do you, have any, do, do you have any grudges? He said, well, I got one. That's where I keep my John Deere. <laughs> Attorney said, uh, no, sir. I mean, do you have a suit? He said, yeah, I got one. I wear it at church on Sunday. Attorney said, sir, I'm, I'm trying to find something. I mean, does your wife beat you up or anything? No, sir, we get up about the same time. We both get up 4.30 every morning. <laughs> Attorney said, well, then, I don't, I don't understand. What is, what is the biggest problem that you have with your wife? He said, well, sir, I believe it is we have a failure to communicate. If I were to title the series that we're in right now, I think I would entitle it, Despite Our Circumstances. And two weeks ago, I brought a message entitled, Reasons to Rejoice. And we know the admonition and the, the command of the Bible to rejoice evermore. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We are to be always in a spirit of rejoicing. Listen, despite our circumstances. And then last week, I brought a message entitled, Divine Delight as we began looking at some of the Beatitudes. And, uh, and we talked about divine here means of the Lord or, or like God, God-like. And, um, and then a delight is happiness. The Beatitudes is happy. But it's, it's not according to circumstances. So this is a deep joy. And we talked about this last week. A deep, deep joy and happiness and fulfillment despite circumstances no matter what's going on you still have that uh, because just regular being happy is like according to if something good is happening I'm happy and and if not then I'm not happy well this morning I want to bring a message entitled real satisfaction you, you have an outline on the back of your bulletin so if you'll follow along there and fill in the blanks real satisfaction and and again let me just say we are to have that despite our circumstances. So would you stand one more time in, in honor of God's word? And I'll begin reading again at verse 1, Matthew 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful. For they shall obtain mercy. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to share with you five ways to real satisfaction. And I want you to get all five of these. Number one, real satisfaction comes with an appetite. Real satisfaction comes with an appetite. Just as eating and drinking are essential for healthy physical lives, and we know that's true, righteousness is essential for being spiritually healthy. And I'm going to define this righteousness in just a little bit. But it's essential. He says in verse 6, and we're going to focus on 6 and 7, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So to hunger and thirst after righteousness means we desire righteousness. Like a starving person wants food. You go without food for a little bit. Some people, I mean, after a day or two or three, they're starving. I'm, I'm just a, a, an hour or two or three and I'm starving. But, but uh, you know, if you're really hungry, right. nobody's got to try to talk you into eating. Right? right? right. If you're really thirsty... Nobody's got to try to beg you to take some water and get and, and drink. Well, listen to me. Why should we be begging people to come to church? Why should even Christians, professing Christians, why do we always have to be trying to get them to come to church? Could it be they're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness? 
You know, when you go to a doctor, one of the first questions they ask if they're trying to discern what's wrong is, how's your appetite? How's your appetite? Brother Vento told me this week that he, this, this Thursday, that he lost his, he had COVID. And uh, I said, you lose your taste and smell? And he said, no, but I sure lost my appetite. I just had to force myself to eat. And it's true. We've got to have an appetite in our physical lives and for physical health. But we need it in our spiritual lives. Amen. Psalm 42.1 says, As the heart or the deer panteth for the water book brooks, so panteth my soul for thee, O God. A good spiritual appetite reveals itself in a craving for the things of God. A craving for the word of God. And to spend time with God. Jeremiah 15, 16, the prophet said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. You know, there are people that have never had this. They've never had one of these. And, and you hear these stories about somebody that smuggled them one. Oh, it may not have been a real nice one. It might have been even just the New Testament. It may have just been a book, just one of the books of the Bible. But oh, they cherish it. They just, they just are so grateful and they just, they just eat it up. It's because they're, they have a hunger and thirst. And they're excited to have it. I'm afraid that oftentimes we just take it for granted. I know I do. And I don't want to. I am so thankful for the Word of God, but I do know I take it for granted so often. So here's a question. How do we acquire a spiritual appetite? Well, for one thing, avoid unhealthy food. Avoid unhealthy. How many of you ever heard this growing up? Now, I don't know about you, but I bet you some of you did. No, no. You'll spoil your dinner. Or you'll spoil your supper. You'll spoil your appetite, right? I heard that all the time. Mom, can I have some cookies? No, we're going to have supper in just a little bit. You'll spoil your appetite, right? Well, see, here's the problem is spiritually speaking, much of what the world is serving up is not good. It's not healthy. A lot of the television and movies, books, a lot of the social media, a lot of the video games, they're not good. Now, in and of in those things, not necessarily bad, but a lot of that's not good. And even if it's not bad, if we're feeding on it all the time, we're full and we're not hungry for the things of God. And so we have to be careful there what we're feeding on all the time. There's an old saying, this book or the Bible will, will keep you from sin, but sin will keep you from the book. It'll keep you from the Bible. Joshua said this, he said, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. The psalmist said, it's more to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. The psalmist said, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. We need an appetite for the word of God. Number two, real satisfaction comes with righteousness. Comes with righteousness. Verse 6 says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. What is righteousness? Let me tell you what is not. He is not speaking here of, about imputed righteousness. So he's not talking about justification or salvation. Righteousness here is a passionate desire. I think this is in your notes for personal holiness. It's a passionate desire for personal holiness. Holiness. Mark Twain once said, having spent considerable time with good people, I understand why Jesus liked to be with tax collectors and sinners. But you know what? Many people feel the same way as Mark Twain did. They don't want to be at church. They don't want to be around Christians. They think that, I mean, if it's what some of us look like sometime, we've been sucking on a lemon, you know, they're sour, they're, they're, or they're hypocritical. They go to church, but I've seen them do things worse than what we do. And so, 
You know, some people don't want, want what Christians talk about having. Um, I read in a recent survey, and this is really sad, but I do believe it. They said that only 20% now, 20% of people in the United States, actually it's less than 20%, I don't know how much less, less than 20% of people in the United States attend church regularly. I think it's getting lower all the time. Less than 20%, we're Christian nation, we have Bibles all over the place, Bible Belt in the South, and yet people are not going to church I also read that over 60%, it was upwards of 63%, never go to church or a small percentage of that go once or twice per year. That's a sad state. And we're the Christian nation. You can imagine what's going on all around. Righteous, if we have a passionate desire for personal holiness, we're going to want to be where the word is being taught. We're going to want to be around Christians. And Jesus gave an illustration of this. I want you to hold your place in in Matthew uh, 5, but turn to Matthew 25. Jesus gives an illustration of righteousness. Matthew chapter 25. And look at verse 35. Jesus says, For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then shall the righteous, righteous here, righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you've done it unto unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. See, it's it's important to know what Jesus is really defining as righteous. It's a person, listen, that does right. (laughs) It's not complicated. It's a person that does right. You say, well, yeah, but who knows what's right and what's wrong? It's a person who does right according to God's word. This is our guidebook. This is is how we know what to do. This is how we know what's right and what's wrong. And so it's a person who does what is right. That's what Jesus is getting across. These people say, "But, but when did we do it? When did we do it? You've been doing it. Jesus said, you've been doing that. When you did this, when you did that, you did this, you did that. Oh, I didn't even know. I didn't realize that. You see, it's second nature. To the Christian who's walking with God, who's living for the Lord, it's just second nature to do right. You don't even notice it. You're certainly not doing it so people will look at me. Look what I'm doing. You lose your rewards that way, by the way. No, You just do it because that's who you are. You're getting more like Jesus all the time. When we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we desire to be like Jesus. And we must allow the Holy Spirit to to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The Holy Spirit needs to be producing these, and He will if we are giving our lives over to Him, and we're living for Him. And it's, it's not by accident that love is number one. It's like the foundation. It's the main thing. It's like the, the, the canvas of a painter. You've got to have a canvas. You've got to have something to paint on. Love is so, it's the foundation of, of the Christian life. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst. You're back at Matthew 5. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then notice what it says. For they shall be filled. You know what that means? If you hunger and thirst after the Lord and his righteousness and doing right and following him, you will find real satisfaction. You just have something that's unexplainable. You have a real satisfaction. And I know some of you really, really have that. And you know what I'm talking about. Lasting satisfaction can only be found in Jesus. 
It's amazing to me how people get further and further away from Jesus and they wonder why things are, and I'm talking about Christians here. They get further and further away from the Lord Jesus and then they wonder why they're not happy. They wonder why things are falling apart. Things are getting worse. Well, you're getting further and further away from Jesus. He said he is the bread of life. He said, I am the bread of life. So if we want that fulfillment, that contentment, that satisfaction, it's only found in Jesus. So how do you know if you, if you currently have a hunger and thirst after righteousness? All right, I'm going to give you a test. Now, if you're like me, you never did like tests. I never have liked tests. But you know what? When they said I was going to have a test, Brother Vince, and they said, but we're going to let you grade your own papers. I always liked that. Not that I was going to cheat. <laughs> I just, it just took something off, you know. I'm grading my own paper, so I'm going to be lenient on myself. So I'm going to let you grade your own paper, but here's three areas to evaluate to see if you are hungry and thirsty after righteousness. Number one, evaluate your schedule. Evaluate your schedule. How much time do you give God? <clears throat> How much time do you give Him during the week? Do you pray? How much time do you pray? Do you read God's Word? How much time do you read God's Word? Do you go to church? You say, well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I disagree with you. I disagree with you. I totally disagree with that statement. Let me, let me explain. You don't, have to be a church, you don't have to be at church to get saved and be saved. But see, to be a Christian means Christ-like. And, and Jesus went to church. Write this verse down, Luke 4, verse 16. Luke 4, verse 16. It says, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on Sabbath day. He commands us, Hebrews 10, 25, to assemble. He didn't say if this happens, that happens, or if you don't have, if you, if you got something going on, you know. He just said assemble. And he, didn't, he said, don't stop. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Number two, evaluate your finances. Oh, me. Evaluate your finances. Turn to Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. How much do you give to God? Malachi, last book of the Old Testament. I want to show you something. <clears throat> and I got a question. Do you tithe? Now, this may be new to you, certainly if you're a new Christian. What in the world is tithe? Tithe is a, is a biblical word, and here's what it means. Tenth. Some people say, well, I tithe 20%. No, you don't. You tithe tenth. You tithe 10, maybe give 10 more percent. But tithe means tenth. And let's see what, what the Bible says. Look at verse 8. In Mal Malachi 3, Malachi 3, look at verse 8. Will a man rob God? You see that? And then what it said, yet you robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? He says, in tithes and offerings. Then he says, you're cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. And then he says this, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I, got, I want to say this to Christians. I'm only talking to Christians. So if you're not a born-again Christian, this is not for you. This is for Christians. He says... In verse 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Now, the tithe is a tenth. The storehouse is the church. And he says, there may be meat in mine house. Prove me there herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. 
And that's things like, so we can pay the electricity, so that you can have comfortable seats, so that you can have a staff like, like our awesome staff that we have, so that we can have instruments, so that we can have a sound system, on and on and on. There's so many things. Air conditioners. So there's, so there's meat in my house. And then look what he says. It's a positive and a negative. He says, and see if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There shall not be room enough to receive it. I'm going to give you a personal testimony. That's what's happened to me and Susan. We've, we've, we've tithed and God has blessed us. I can't even begin to tell you. You say, well, are you rich, pastor? You better believe I am. Oh, oh, not with money. If you're talking about money, no. <laughs> but man, things that are way more valuable than money. And then he says the negative. He says, and I will rebuke the devourer. Devourer for your sakes. Now, what's that? Well, see, it's like this. If you don't tithe, next thing you know, this is going to break down. You have car trouble over here. You're going to have appliances that break down. You're going to have to spend more money over here. Somebody's going to, going to rob you. On and on and on. Because he's, he's not rebuking the devourer if you don't honor him and with your tithe. You believe that, Pastor? I believe it 100%. And all my life, it's, pro it's been proven out. My parents proved it. And many of you, I know, have proven it. And many of you have stories that you could share that very thing. And so get in on the good here. If you're not tithing, you want to. What does it mean? What is it? I don't, still don't understand. Pastor, we can barely pay our bills. That's the problem. You see, the, the, the tent is first. If I get $1,000, 100 is God's. I'm not giving it to God. It's God's. That's what the Bible teaches. It belongs to him. So if I get $1,000, $100 is, goes to the church. Now, I hope, now we'll see if I have enough to pay my bills. He said, well, don't you need to pay your bills first? Oh, listen, I'm not going to rob God. 10% is God's. I, I, to be honest with you, I don't want to rob anybody. But I'm sure not going to rob God. You can say, Amen. Or you can say, oh, me. I want you to get on the good. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Evaluate your schedule. Evaluate your finances. And thirdly, evaluate your attitude toward people. Do you love people? Are you one of these that just, I don't like people. Love is, is very key. Let's see where you are in, in having a desire for righteousness. Number three, I'm going to have to go really fast now. Real satisfaction comes with mercy. Comes with mercy. I'll just tell you one story here. I'll remind you. A scribe asked Jesus a question. He said, um, who is my neighbor? And, uh, and Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. He said there was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and some men attacked him. They brutally beat him. They robbed him, and they left him to die on the side of the road. So he's there. He's bleeding. He's hurting. He may die. And a priest walks by. He sees him. He sees he's hurt, but he does nothing and keeps going. A Levite goes by. He sees him. He sees he's hurting, but he keeps going. By the way, they were both religious leaders. Leaders. But a Samaritan comes by, the ones that's hated by the Jews. He goes over, quickly helps him. He gives him some water. He bandages him up. He stops the bleeding. He puts him on his donkey. He takes him to get more help, lodging, food, and he pays for it. Jesus said, which one is the neighbor? The scribe said, the one that showed mercy. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Luke 6, 36 says, Be ye therefore merciful as your Father is merciful. Number four, real satisfaction. I want you to think about some of these. I'm going fast, but meditate on them. Ask yourself if you hunger and thirst after righteousness. Real satisfaction comes with patience. You ever been around people that are just arrogant, obnoxious, mean, critical, whiners? 
I mean, some of you are that way. No, I'm just kidding. We all have to be around people like that sometime, right? I mean, we live with people that are just going to be that way. That's just part of it. But here, a merciful person is patient with difficult people. That you want to know if you're merciful? It's how you handle difficult people. That'll show you where you are, whether you're really merciful. It's easy to be merciful with people that are treating you wonderful. And then number, number four, real satisfaction comes with patience. And I'll give you that one. Let me go to number five because our time's almost up. Real satisfaction comes with forgiveness. And this is the, maybe the toughest of all. Love doesn't hold grudges, doesn't retaliate, doesn't keep a record of hurts. The real test of forgiveness comes when the same person hurts you over and over and over. Again, it's easy to forgive people maybe once. But what if they do it again and do it again and do it again? Peter asked Jesus, he said, how many times are, we, how many times are you teaching us to forgive, Lord? Seven times? Now, the law said three times. So Peter is doubling it and adding one for good measure. So surely Jesus is going to say, wow, Peter, <laughs> you're on the right track. No, Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. In other words, you can't put a limit on it. You just keep forgiving. And then Ephesians 4.32 explains it. It says, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. How has God forgiven you? Let me ask you. Has he forgiven you once or twice? Or thousands and thousands and thousands of times? I'm probably up in the millions. Don't laugh. You're no better than I am. Well, you probably are. But God just keeps forgiving I'll close with this. There was a man who stole some, a young employee, he stole some money secretly from his company. And um, he's been ordered into the, the senior executive's office and he's concerned if they found out. See, he's guilty. And he's thinking, if they found out, man, I'm going to lose my job and I don't know what in the world I'd do. And then it dawned on him, if they found out, they may press criminal charges. I could go to jail. I mean, I could be in trouble. I may have to get a lawyer. I have to, you know, defend myself and on and on and on. And he said, and I am guilty. Man, he starts realizing he's going to destroy my family and on and on. Just as he's going up to the office. And sure enough, when he gets there, this senior executive, he said, this is what's been reported. Did you, did you take this money? And he said, yes, sir, I did. The senior executive said, if I keep you here in your present capacity, can I trust you in the future? Young worker brightened up. He said, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, you surely can. I, I, I've learned my lesson. The executive said, I'm not going to press charges. And I am going to keep you here if you make that promise to me. And he said, I want to tell you something else. You're not the first one that stole from this company and was shown mercy and forgiveness. He said, the senior executive said, I was the first one that did it. And I was shown mercy and forgiveness. And then he said, it's only the grace of God that can keep us both. I guess I want you to examine your your life, where you are with the Lord. Are you merciful? Are you patient? Are you forgiving? Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Do you have a passionate desire for the things of God? We need to seek that. Because if we do, if we seek that and we find that, that's where real satisfaction is. Let's all stop.